What is up, guys? We're going to be taking a look at this lab, CSRF, where token is tied to non-session cookie. So in the previous part of the CSRF lab series, we saw an example where the CSRF token was not tied to the user session. This allowed us to log in as a completely different user, grab their single use CSRF token, and then simply reuse that CSRF token for the HTTP request dispatched from the victim's browser. So we learned the importance of the CSRF token being linked to the session. This particular lab is an evolution of that. In this case, the CSRF token is going to be tied to a cookie, but it's not going to be the session cookie. So that's why the title is CSRF where token is tied to a non-session cookie. So we have a similar problem in place where this CSRF token is not actually linked to the user's session. So it's going to be possible for us to grab that CSRF token from a completely separate account. The only difference here, it's going to be slightly more secure because there's still going to be a check as to whether that CSRF token matches up with a CSRF cookie. Now, don't worry too much if it doesn't make sense just yet. Let's start from the beginning. You'll see all of this in action. First thing we're going to do is head to my account and log in with the provided credentials, Wiener, Peter. In the background, we are going to be capturing the HTTP requests with burp proxy, and we're going to make use of this update email functionality. So we're going to change it to Wiener at newemail.net. Let's choose update email. Now here is a copy of the post request sent by burp suite to forward slash my account change email. If we take a look at the post request body, we can see our cross site request forgery token. We can see the email parameter for the new email we want to set, but we can also see that we have two cookie values. We have the session cookie value. We then have a CSRF key cookie. Now the most secure iteration of this is that the CSRF token is going to be linked to the session cookie. This way, only the user with that session ID can actually receive the CSRF token as part of the form on the page. Whereas that is not what is happening here. The CSRF token is actually linked to this CSRF key cookie. And neither of those are actually linked to the user account itself. In other words, if we have a copy of this exact CSRF token and we have this CSRF key, set as part of the cookie header, then we now have a valid CSRF token. It doesn't need to be linked to the user account. Now, previously we didn't have the requirement for this CSRF key cookie. We were able to simply take the CSRF token from one account and reuse it for a second user. Now, in this case, we can copy and paste the CSRF token, but we also need to set CSRF key as part of the cookie header. Now that's not straightforward. We can't just arbitrarily set headers on behalf of the victim. What needs to happen here is that the site itself that the victim is visiting needs to respond with a set cookie header, which contains the information regarding the cookies to be set. The victim then sets those headers and reuses them as part of any subsequent HTTP requests to the web app. So we can't arbitrarily do that as the attacker. It needs to come from the web app itself. So we need a second vulnerability where we can force the web app to return that set cookie header to the victim, which in turn provokes the victim's browser into setting whichever arbitrary header we want to. So unless we can find that second vulnerability, this setup is actually secure in itself. But if we do find any type of arbitrary set header functionality using the web app, then it actually bypasses this particular form of cross-site request forgery protection. That's why it's always better if the CSRF token is linked directly to the session cookie. Now, of course, it just so happens that this particular web app does have that second type of vulnerability. It's found in the search functionality of the blog section. Let's just input an arbitrary search term here. And once again, we're going to capture the subsequent HTTP requests using burp. Now here is a copy of the response in burp. We can see that our search term has actually been injected into the set cookie header. 
set cookie last search term equals Zensha. We can potentially make use of a technique referred to as header injection, where we include some carriage return characters, and then we can begin to set arbitrary headers. So for example, at the end of our injection point, which is just after Zenshal here, we could have some type of carriage return character. We could then inject a new set cookie header, and we can make use of that CSRF key value. In other words, we can set the CSRF key value in the victim's browser. That's then going to be sent to the web app with subsequent HTTP requests. We can then simply provide the cross-site request forgery token that's linked with that CSRF key. And then we can use that combination for any account. So long as the CSRF token matches up with the CSRF key cookie, it doesn't matter which session is involved because this is not tied to the session itself. Here in the Portswigger walkthrough, we're given the vulnerable search term we can make use of to inject the specific CSRF key we're looking to inject. Now, in this case, none of this information is single use, so we can actually just reuse the CSRF key that we've been given in the first request that we made as part of this lab. So we've sent that search query string to the repeater. Let's delete the existing search term. We've now injected the vulnerable string. So we have search equals test. We have the carriage return characters. We then have a new set cookie, CSRF key equals, and then we have a your key constant. We need to simply provide the CSRF key here. Now, in this case, it has already been set, but the point is we could provide something arbitrary here. In fact, let's just do that as a demonstration. CSRF key equals Zen shell. Let's send that to the back end. Let's take a look at the response. So notice we have set cookie, last search term equals test. This is the point where we've injected those carriage return characters. We then have a new set cookie, CSRF key equals Zen shell. So you can see because of this header injection vulnerability, we have the ability to arbitrarily set that CSRF key cookie in the victim's browser. So let's do that. Let's copy the CSRF key. Instead of Zen shell, we're now going to inject the CSRF key. Let's choose send. And you can see now the web app is setting the CSRF key, which is going to match up with our CSRF token. Now, of course, everything we're doing is on our own account at this moment. This is just a proof of concept in terms of the header injection. We actually now need to combine everything into a fully fledged cross site request forgery attack. And for that, we're going to head to the exploit server. Now, notice here in the walkthrough that it recommends that we start off with a solution to the CSRF vulnerability with no defenses lab. It's going to require some modification, but it's going to be a good starting point for the HTML snippet. So let's head to that lab. We'll copy this HTML snippet. Let's head back to the lab that we're working on. We're now going to head to the exploit server. Let's paste our HTML snippet. Now, a couple of housekeeping activities. First of all, we've seen in previous labs that this URL encoded percent 40 is going to break the functionality of the cross site request forgery attack. We simply need to replace that with an at character. So we're going to be changing the email to anything at websecurityacademy.net. And as is standard with the majority of these exploit server type labs, we need to paste our lab ID in place of the your lab ID constant here. So let's just grab that value, choose copy. I'm going to paste that in place of the your lab ID constant. Now we know that the request has to have two pieces of information. First of all, we need the cross site request forgery token as part of the post request body. So let's copy that from a previous request. We can now add a second hidden input to this form. Input type equals hidden name equals CSRF value equals, and then we're going to paste in our cross site request forgery token, which we're reusing. Now we can no longer make use of this self submitting documents.form at index zero submit. The reason is that if we tried using the attack as is, the header is not going to be sent by the victim's browser. So first of all, we need to convince the victim's browser to send an initial request based around that header injection vulnerability so that the web app prompts the victim to start including that CSRF key value as part of the header cookie. It explains it to us here, step nine of the walkthrough, remove the auto submit script block and instead add the following code to inject the cookie. It's an image tag. Let's paste it into the exploit server. 
We'll then talk about what it does. So we want to get rid of the script tags in their entirety because we're not going to be using JavaScript from within script tags. We're actually going to be making use of an image element. We'll then be using the on error attribute. This is definitely going to error out because it's not going to be a valid image. And then on error, we're going to call document.forms at index zero submit. Once again, we're going to need to paste in our lab ID. So this image source is going to dispatch a HTTP request to the endpoint with the vulnerable query string. Remember it has search equals test. We then inject the carriage return characters. We then provide a new set cookie header, and we're going to make use of the CSRF key that we want to set as the cookie header. That's going to be another constant that we need to paste into this. At the moment, we just have capital letters, your key. So the idea here is so long as the CSRF token and the CSRF key match up, likely they're going to be linked together somewhere in a backend database. It does not matter which CSRF token and which CSRF key you use. They're not linked to the session. They're just tied together in a pair. So one CSRF token is going to work with one CSRF key. So we've grabbed the value of the CSRF key. Instead of the constant your key, we're going to paste in the value of CSRF key. So the process here is the victim is going to visit the attacker control domain. It's going to try and load up the image. And when images are loaded, a HTTP request is dispatched by the browser to the endpoint contained in the source attribute. So the victim's browser dispatches that HTTP request to perform the search. The header injection vulnerability is manipulated in the HTTP response. The victim's browser is now convinced to start making use of that set cookie header with the CSRF key. However, because an image is not correctly retrieved, now document.forms.submit is called. Post request is going to be dispatched to the change email endpoint along with the CSRF token as a hidden input on the form. Just make sure you close that with the right angle bracket as well. And of course, alongside that CSRF token is going to be the CSRF key, which is included as a header. So let's choose the store option. Now let's choose deliver exploit to victim. Now we get the message, congratulations, you solved the lab. Two key mitigations here. First of all, if your security is based around a header, but your site also offers a header injection vulnerability, then it's possible to just completely bypass any security that's based around headers. So in some ways, this lab is really a header injection vulnerability because we're able to set arbitrary headers in the victim's browser. So mitigation number one, make sure you don't have any header injection vulnerabilities. Mitigation number two is because the token is not tied to the session, it's actually just tied to a non-session cookie. We're basically able to just make use of any CSRF token. So long as it matches up with the CSRF key in the header, we can get our CSRF token from anywhere. So the second mitigation here is don't tie the CSRF token to a cookie, tie it to the actual session of the user. That way, only the user with a specific session can access the CSRF token. So we can't make use of any arbitrary CSRF token now. We have to use the CSRF token that's only given to the user that has that specific session. Now it becomes very difficult for the attacker to access that CSRF token unless they have some other type of attack vector in place like a cross-site scripting attack vector. But the idea is the attacker can't access that CSRF token because they don't have access to the session cookie. Remember, that's the whole point of a CSRF attack. It allows us to get around the fact that we don't have access to the victim's session token. But if we don't have access to the session token, then we can't access the CSRF token to begin with. We don't have a valid attack vector in this case. So key mitigation here, make sure the CSRF token is tied to the victim session. There's usually going to be an entry into a backend database somewhere that says this CSRF token is linked to this user with this session. So the attacker would have to know both the session cookie and the CSRF token in order to have a valid attack. They can't get the CSRF token without the session token, and they simply don't have any decent way to access the session token unless there's some other type of vulnerability with the web app. All right, that's pretty much it for this lab. Thanks very much for checking out the content, and I look forward to catching you guys in the next lab.